NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. So very excited for this panel um, this afternoon that's going to be focusing on data-driven policies, criminal justice data collection. So I'm going to um, briefly introduce our, our moderator, and, and so glad to have her. Um, it's Michaela Rabinowitz, and she is the Director of National Engagement and Field Operations for Measures for Justice. She is going to be moderating this panel discussion on data-driven policies, criminal justice data collection, and she will further introduce our esteemed panel. So Michaela, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Monica. Um, this is a really exciting panel and I am honored uh, to have the opportunity to moderate it. So just a, a little bit of additional housekeeping. So as much as possible, our hope is really to have this be a conversation rather than a series of discrete presentations. Although we also recognize that that is a little bit more difficult when we are all zooming in from various locations. Um, in addition, we would like to take questions as we go. So I will do my best to both kind of moderate the conversation and also review the questions in real time as Monica said, we may not get to all of your questions. Um, and if we turn out to not be able to integrate them into the full conversation, we'll try to leave a few minutes at the end for Q&A. But before we dive in beyond that, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves um, and give a little bit of background information as to why they uh, are speaking on this panel today. So starting in reverse alphabetical order, we'll ask Rebecca and then Brian and then Richard to briefly introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm really uh, thankful to be here with you all. My name is Rebecca Wallace, she, her. I'm a senior staff attorney and senior policy counsel at the ACLU of Colorado. I work almost exclusively on criminal legal reform, and I do a lot of work at the legislature and um, have focused a lot on data uh, legislation over the last couple of years. Looking forward to this conversation. I'm Brian Kennedy. I am the policy director for a group called Justice Forward Virginia. We focus on criminal legal system reform. In Virginia, I am also a senior assistant public defender in Fairfax County and an NACDL member. Um, I'm here because we did a lot of work on pretrial data reform in Virginia. I would consider it a work in progress, but definitely a lot of things on how, what not to do and lessons learned. Hi, my name is uh, Rich Colangelo. I'm the chief state's attorney for the state of Connecticut. I've uh, been a prosecutor going on 28 years now. Um, I'm here because in Connecticut, we had a prosecutorial transparency bill passed uh, a year and a half ago, uh, requiring prosecutors to capture data. Um, we worked with the ACLU to actually get that done here in Connecticut. Uh, we're required to, or OPM, the Office of Policy and Management in Connecticut, is required to do a presentation on the data every year for the Criminal Justice Commission. So those are two of the um, handouts that you guys are going to have. Great. Thanks so much. So for those of you in attendance, our goal is really to hit on three main topics today. The first two are related to challenges. So challenges with the passing of criminal justice data legislation or policy change related to criminal justice data. The second for um, Rebecca and Richard in particular um, are challenges with implementation. Once you've actually passed some sort of data policy change, what are the potentially unanticipated challenges that emerge in trying to implement that? And then third, for all, for all the panelists, really to talk about how they um, think about and understand the balance between transparency and confidentiality when it comes to criminal justice data. Um, so in, we'll start now in the reverse order uh, of the introductions. And Richard, I'll ask you to start and just speak about some of the challenges, both in terms of the initial passage of the bill, as well as where things are, and what are the challenges with implementation. Um, and then I, I really encourage Brian and Rebecca to um, you know, think about how that relates to your experiences and, and weigh in to make this more conversational. Initially, when the, the conversation first started about capturing data or making sure that prosecutors had data, um, you know, there was a lot of pushback from prosecutors, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it was a situation where we really didn't understand and know what uh, people were looking for. Um, then once we started getting into it and realizing that, you know, that would actually help us be able to explain and show the public what we do, um, you know, it, it kind of took off from there. Uh, it was actually, I think, the, one of the only bills a couple of years ago that passed unanimously through the legislature. Um, so it was, you know, once we got it through, it was um, 
once we kind of got an understanding of what it was, it, it was, you know, kind of, there was no more pushback from, from prosecutors uh, in, in the Division of Criminal Justice. And one of the, the, the biggest issues is when you're doing legislation, kind of trying to figure out what actually should be part of what the bill entails. You know, a lot of, we found that a lot of what the legislator was looking for, um, and the ACLU had a big input in, in Connecticut into what was, what went into the bill. Um, so what we were looking for was data that were in other places. And one of the biggest problems we had in Connecticut is, uh, believe it or not, we don't have a case management system yet for the prosecutors in Connecticut. So I don't have any data for the Division of Criminal Justice. We're relying on judicial data. Um, so that was kind of another um, kind of surprise. It's like, okay, how do we do this? How do we comply with it without, you know, kind of having to fill out pieces of paper for every case that we dispose of? So those are the initial um, kind of hurdles, and, and we're still working on getting our case management system set up um, to be able to fill in a couple of the gaps where we couldn't find the data other places. Uh, looking at the law, you know, what our, what our last best offer was is something that, you know, really is not something no one's going to have with the prosecutor. Uh, was there victim input? You know, was there uh, any um, non-judicial uh, diversionary program, the kind of a prosecutorial diversionary program done? So those are data points that don't exist anyplace else but the prosecutor's office. Great. Thank you so much. Rebecca, um, it would be great if you could weigh in a little bit on some of the challenges that you guys experienced and how you thought about those around some of the implementation of the data legislation in Colorado. Sure. Um, so I, I have just a really recent example that I'll give about challenges with implementation. In 2019, we passed a jail data collection bill, and um, it requires Colorado jails to respond report really extensive data. I'm gonna just put it in the chat, although I do, I think there is a, um, in the materials you'll see links to all this, but um, it requires Colorado jails to re report pretty extensive information about their population every quarter, you know, pretrial population, data on race and ethnicity. And this is something that we were really not able to get done until we got the legislature interested in the jail population generally. We were talking about it for years in the legislature and they kept asking, how many people are in jail, right? Really simple question. And we got to say over and over again, nobody knows. You know, the last time was when, um, when the Bureau of Justice Statistics did it or the ACLU can spend six months doing a data study. Like, and um, so that was, you know, th when the legislature got frustrated is when we were able to pass that bill. And we have these 64 counties, they all, um, keep data differently, and we were funneling this into one trusted um, state um, uh, state program that that deals with this data. Well, we finally got the data reports, and we have actually been tracking the jail data ourselves at the ACLU because of COVID. It was that, a very unique reason we were tracking it, and the data was thousands off. And when we went to go study it, just to give an example of how off it is, is they have one jail that accommodates like 35 people and it showed over 300 people in the jail. So just really demonstrably inaccurate. And I don't know that we would have gone through the data in that way. And so uh, if it hadn't been for the fact that we're relying on it so carefully related to COVID and the decarceration that we've seen. And so an implementation is, you know, accuracy, especially when you're getting all the data from various local jurisdictions. And I, I actually am curious, Richard, if, because I'm presuming this, there, there's data that has to be reported by the various um, district attorneys, right? Offices and like, if there's concerns about the um, accuracy or consistency of the data there, we're also looking at a DA data collection bill. And um, so that's, that's just one example of one of the implementation problems that uh, we're struggling with. And we're actually actively going after our state agency and saying, we're going to have to out you about your inaccurate data unless you do something about it. And they look like they're starting to do something about it. If I can, Michael, is that all right? Um, you're right, Rebecca. One of the things that we're trying to do is to get that case management system so it's uniform and, and kind of, it's almost changing the culture, right? I mean, it's kind of scary sometimes. I'm asking lawyers to actually kind of be lawyers and document what they're doing in their files in the case management system. So making sure they do that. Um, and we'll be able to check that to see. Um, and we'll, we'll be able to generate reports to, to make sure that the, the information is supposed to be there. So any kind of best practices or, you know, hey, look out for this, I would point that out that, you know, you want to make sure that you're, you know, you have a way to check because, you know, we, we ran into that. Uh, we have better correction data than I guess Colorado does. Um, 
but that's a function of, I guess, OPM doing that work for, for Connecticut for a while. I mean, our, our data is accurate for our statewide, uh, but our DOC, but each of our county jails run independently. And Richard, in Connecticut, prosecutors are appointed and you have one state agency, right? Is that my right about that? Absolutely, Brian. And that, that, that's huge, right? And, and that's why, um, you know, we're able to have more control over it. Um, but I have to tell you, though, I mean, I, I don't think you're going to get much pushback from prosecutor agencies as far as buy-in for collecting the data. Because, you know, the, they, they're going to want the data to be able to explain what they do. Um, you know, the first report that was done this year in Connecticut, you know, just looked at the 2019 disposed of cases for that year. And in looking at it, the majority of the cases, 60 plus thousand of the 127,000 cases uh, were nollied by prosecutors. So the prosecutors actually, you know, dropped those charges at some point in time during their, um, you know, their pendency in court. And, and, you know, that's huge for prosecutors to be able to say, hey, look, we're actually screening cases. We're actually doing what you want us to do. It's not like we're, you come in the front door and we're, put, you know, sending you out to, to jail. We're actually having some input in these cases. And, and without looking at that data, prosecutors don't know what they're doing or where they're coming from. I think a problem we have, it hasn't been like an express problem in Virginia from prosecutors, so I'm not saying that, but definitely in other contexts from judges who are also elected, at least partially in Virginia, that I think people are afraid of getting the data sometimes because we all know what the data is going to show. Because every time I work in a pretty progressive part of the state, and every time we get data, it shows racial and ethnic disparities that we all know are there, but it proves it, right? So I think a lot of worry from a lot of people, especially judges, is that the data will be used to show that they're acting in a racially biased way or an other implicit or explicit biased way without understanding that maybe everything's a little bit more complicated than that and that people, you know, maybe people are smart and won't just blame them for being racist when it shows disparities in a system that's designed to have racial disparities. I would, in my experience, certainly echo, um, I think what Brian is hinting at around the, the difference in, um, in the attitudes towards racial, excuse me, towards data transparency among elected versus appointed officials. And I um, agree that, that in, from what I have seen often, in part because practitioners don't know what their own data shows, I think you're right that often they do know that it will show racial disparities, but beyond that, because of the poor data collection systems and data collection practices in, across the criminal legal system, many practitioners don't know what their own data will show. And so there's often a trepidation around making public information that they have not yet been able to vet. Um, I guess sort of along the, oh, Richard, it looks like you wanna oh, respond well, to that, please. Or, or even understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, even looking into the basic data that we had, um, you know, the top 15 charges that or people are arrested for in Connecticut have been kind of those top 15 charges for the last three years. Um, you know, so just, it's like, wow, you know, I've been in the system doing, dealing with the cases and I didn't even understand that. So you're right. I mean, until you look at it, you don't know what you have. And that's why people are nervous. Brian, my understanding is um, you all have been working on pretrial data policy changes, but have not yet seen those implemented. I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about the challenges that you have confronted in trying to get those changes implemented in you know, past. We've had a pretty broad coalition of partners um, including NACDL and ACLU and many others, working on this for I think three years now, um, trying to get just pretrial data collection in the system. Um, and the biggest pushback we get is obviously fiscal from our General Assembly, which I think comes in two ways. I included in the materials the fiscal impact statement we get, which I feel like in Virginia are completely works of fiction um, or what people imagine things will cost based of, instead of being based on any actual facts. Um, you know, it'll cost $15 million um, without any real analysis, partially because they only calculate costs. They don't cost calculate savings, which I think is a big thing with data where no one's showing the investment. Like if we invest in data, we're going to be able to save money long term when we actually know what's going on. Um, so that's been our biggest issue. We finally were able to get it worked out where there'd be a pilot program and now they're looking at the cost of the pilot program to see when we can start the pilot program. Um, but while we're doing that, we're obviously trying to do actual substantive pretrial reform as well, but it's hard when you're trying to talk out of both sides of your mouth and there's a lot of advocates that want to do more substantive work, 
but then we're trying to say we need the data to know what substantive work needs to happen. So there's been challenges both on the legislative side as well as the advocacy side about how to frame that. And if I could follow up on that, um, Brian, you know, I, uh, fiscal note is always at the key of the problem of passing the bills. And we're always looking to our state to um, create the database and, um, you know, push it out publicly. And we have found that the fiscal note really depends on how supportive the state agency is or the state agency's boss, like the governor or whoever's at the head of the state agency is of our efforts. So we have found time very well spent um, talking about policy the year before with the agency that is going to be in charge of doing it and engaging them early. That doesn't always work to get them um, to the point that they're supportive of the bill, but we have seen it, that that can really change the outcome of the fiscal note. And then just a practitioner's tip that many here may already know, it's not ideal, but we do delayed implementation and we're able to at least push um, the fiscal note out a year or two and uh, that, that can help. Um, and I, in fact, there was a bill, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit, but um, that we were able to pass this year, it's a police accountability bill and it has a substantial data collection provision and we could have never passed it uh, because COVID has of course wreaked havoc on our economy as it has I'm sure everywhere. We could have never passed that data collection piece um, if we hadn't pushed out the state uh, publication of the data a couple years. We are asking for law, local law enforcement to start collecting before then and that is not a fiscal cost that shows up in our fiscal note because it's uh, those are local jurisdictions and it isn't a state fiscal cost for better or for worse. I think part of the problem we have with doing that in Virginia, like everywhere else, is that the system is so decentralized. So I think it turned out that we wanted, you know, it was 13 areas, probably 20 something pieces of data that were held by 14 different state agencies or local agencies. Um, and that's before you try to get elected prosecutors in every county across the state or elected sheriffs in every county across the state to give you that. So. We, we made inroads with a couple agencies and then they turned around and gave outrageous fiscal impacts anyway. <laughs> um, but trying to do that with everybody is really difficult. And I, I think it's just the time that it takes to do it is also really hard. And that's a great point, Brian, because in, in looking at the 27 data points they wanted in the bill, um, judicial had most of them, you know, so we were able to kind of get it there. And, and for the ones that they didn't have, we were able to get them through corrections or other places because we didn't have any of them. So that, that's, a, that's a great point. And Richard, how did you all address, uh, in addition to kind of leveraging data that's otherwise available, how did you guys ad ad address potential cost concerns related to the cost of purchasing case management systems for all state's attorneys across Connecticut? One of the things that we had going for us is that we um, we're already in the process of getting the case management system up and running in Connecticut. I mean, it was, it was already bonded. They already had buy-in for it. One of the issues we had is, is, is we tied our, one of the, I guess, mistakes, is we tied our case management system to a, a larger um, criminal justice information system. So we're going to be able to get feeds from judicial, feeds from the police departments, and push out information to you know, the end user, uh, corrections and parole, probation, those type of things. Um, so that was already in the works. It, it, it's been 10 years. Um, so we had it already going. So the problem we had was not um, agreeing to it or getting it ready. It was uh, more of a, hey, it's not working yet. So how am I going to capture that data um, in the meantime? But you're right. I mean, they're, they're I mean, I, I think we were bonded for about $4 million for our portion of the project, but they're up over $12 million already, which is kind of ridiculous to say over the, the time that we've been doing. Um, but I mean, I have to tell you, Brian, I mean, and, and I'll, be, I'll offer this to anybody, honestly, if I could help in talking to your prosecutorial agency to explain, you know, how beneficial it is, please reach out to me and I'll be happy to talk to whoever you want me to. Um, it, it really is that important, I think, for us to have the data. Um, you know, there's a question on, on racial disparity. And, and if you look at, you know, the data in Connecticut, yes, it says there is, there is one and, and, and we get that. But the thing that struck me the most when I looked at the data is, you know, four of our biggest cities, uh, New Haven, Hartford, Waterbury and, and Bridgeport, give us uh, about 60% of the business in the system. But if you look at those 
four cities, they also give us about 65% of the reported um, violent crimes. So those, and about 62% of the black and brown uh, minorities live in those cities. So, you know, I'm looking at it as not as a, you know, my disparity, honestly, is that there is a, a victimization problem in this area. What can we do in the system to make sure that we're addressing that issue and making sure those people are safe in their area? And maybe it's not locking people up. I, I get that. It's, maybe it's providing services. But, you know, that's something that was glaring to me with the data. Has anything been glaring or surprised you in the data, Rebecca, other than the implausibility of some of the numbers that you've been seeing? How did your expectations align with what it has you've, you've seen? Um, so our police accountability bill, I, I, we don't have the data yet on that. Um, I, the other two bills that we have, which is the solitary confinement bill and the jail data collection bill, no, we basically wanted to be able to have proof for the things we had been saying. But I can give you an area where we just had a bunch of data collection where we made a, it's making a huge difference that I think will be of interest to this group. We have a pretrial risk assessment tool. It's called the CPAT. Um, which is widely used and uh, in Colorado. And, you know, the ACLU has been a little bit of a lone voice along with one other group, the Colorado Freedom Fund, saying these tools are biased, like amongst pretrial reformers. Many, understandably, and I know that's also true within many of the criminal defense community, think that these are very important tools to um, help with pretrial release. And many people that I respect in the uh, in our public defender's office feel that way. And, um, but we have felt that this is a racist tool and we had a lot of reasons why and we've been saying it forever. And um, it, we finally got the data on it. So we finally got a study and the data just came out um, about a week, two weeks ago. And it shows incredible race bias, gender, sex bias, and bias against people experiencing homelessness by showing much high elevated levels of false positives for those individuals. So they're being basically um, said to be dangerous but um, are much less likely to do anything that poses a public safety risk or even fail to appear in court. That data is going to change the conversation about risk assessment tools in Colorado. And I think already I've seen it be very important to our public defender's office, who of course, even they wanna get people out, they think the tool is helpful to get people out, but uh, fighting racism is also at the top of their list. Um, so we just had an article come out in the paper about it, and now the conversation is really, really starting to take off. And that is the data. Rebecca, can I ask you a question about that? When yeah. that data came out, did you just get the report with conclusions from some agency, or did you have access to the actual data itself? Um, it's a good question. So we got the report, although the report has a lot of data in it. It's a very wonky 40 page report. And it wasn't us. It was actually the, the government contracted with these university folks to do it. I don't know if they are going to release the underlying data or not. But I will say that this group that did it, if anything, is inclined towards finding the tool to be useful. Okay, that is what they were they, they are not inclined towards finding things that are going to make the tool not useful. So it's a pretty big deal that the bias was so clear. Uh, I asked because we have, with the pretrial space, we obviously have a risk assessment tool in Virginia that a lot of people may use, the Virginia Pretrial Risk Assessment Instrument. Um, and then our State Crime Commission has also been doing a study over the past few years about pretrial. And it was supposed to be data. They collected data. It was a basically just about one cohort of people from a few years ago, they finally came out with a report. And when advocates saw the report, which was mostly the conclusions versus the underlying information, we had a lot of questions about the analysis. We had a lot of questions about what they were, the, their interpretation. And that wasn't just from you know me who knows almost nothing about quantitative methods or anything like that, but economists and people like that. So we've been having trouble getting even if a state agency collects a little bit of data, that the lack of transparency in that data or the lack of others to go in and look at it, examine it, see if they come up to the same conclusions has been really difficult, which I think is a you know, tension we're gonna talk about, but even just about what state agencies can do once we have it. I think that's a really good point. Um, I'm gonna be, I, I will be very interested to see, we're gonna have our own data folks from National run this data and it'll be interesting if we can get it. Interesting to see if we can. One thing I will say is that we are building into our legislation that when the state 
posts um, the data, that they post the raw searchable data as well. Um, that isn't, this isn't coming from a bill, the CPAT piece, so I, I don't know what they're gonna say in response to our open records request. But um, it has been really useful that we can go and get the raw data and work with it for our other legislation that we've talked about. And we did that in our policing bill that we just passed that the raw data has to be available as well. Um, and it, it is really frustrating and people have been frustrated regarding um, the CPAT not being able to get underlying data in years past. That's been a, a point of frustration. So well taken. So this is actually an issue that is very near and dear to my heart and, and certainly to everything we do at Measures for Justice. So I'd love to um, explore this a little bit deeper, um, which really is that tension between maximum transparency, access to the raw data to allow people, organizations, advocates to do their own analyses and, and see what the results look like, and then wanting to balance that with protecting the confidentiality of the human beings whose lives and experiences are reflected in that data. Um, Rebecca, since you started talking about this, I'm interested in hearing how you think about balancing those issues. So when you talk about raw data being available, does that include personally identifying information? Does that include things, in, uh, identifiers that would allow you to link people from a certain data set to another data set? Um, more generally, how do you think about people um, relative to transparency? Um, it's complicated. And um, we, we have definitely taken the view that in aggregate raw data that a criminal defendant's personal identifying information does not go in it. Now, we have never taken that view regarding records requests, right? We, we continue to push that that is an open record, even if we're getting data through open records. But if we're, public, if we're asking for publication of a huge data set, um, we do not want any personal identifying information of criminal defendants, and we continue to believe that there should be personal identifying information regarding um, police, police officers and law enforcement. So, I mean, not their personal addresses, but um, their badge numbers and their names. And um, that is the approach that we took in our most recent uh, two bills. Um, just something interesting is that we in our police accountability bill, we're also focused a lot on making body cam video available, which is I think a form of data actually. Um, and we, our, our biggest balancing point that I'm not sure we struck frankly all that well was with um, victims groups with whom we care very deeply about how they experience having their, um, those videos released. Um, and you will see all kinds of exceptions that people in the criminal defense world are very sad or in there and that I, pers I personally feel very conflicted about, but also like felt that the victims were there in good faith, you know, really arguing for, for their, you know, for what they needed. And um, that was uh, challenging. So that's not much of an answer, but that's, that's some observations. Richard, can you speak a little bit about how you all are planning on addressing this? How, how raw is the data that will be transparent versus how aggregated? And, and are there any policies that you guys have in place so far around access to you know, the raw this, data by researchers or others? The, the statute is really clear. I mean, it had to be disaggregated, disaggregated sorry, um, for the defendants. Um, so you could tie it to a docket number, but you know, no name attached to it. You really can't figure out who it is. And the same situation went for, for victims. So, um, you know, that's kind of the rawest. It's, it's weird to say, but, you know, you're able to tell, or, or looking at that data, you really can't do much with it. You really want to get the case level data because even, you know, two people charged with the same crime aren't really similarly situated based on, you know, it could be a different, the charge is the charge, but they're, you know, people get treated differently because of, you know, their record, the victim's input, the injuries to the victim, you know, an assault one could be, you know, dismemberment of somebody, or it could also be, you know, something that caused a scar, you know, the extent of the injury. So looking at just the charge level data um, really doesn't get us where we want to go or where we should be going. So, you know, that's kind of, I think, going to be something like Rebecca said, something that we're going to have to deal with once these are put into place, you know, what, where can we go? Um, you know, but those, the advocacy groups and the victim groups, I mean, they, they do, um, you know, they come out of force. I mean, in our police accountability bill, it just went through the legislative session and the special session recently. Um, you know, the, the police um, unions had a lot to say about what 
they were looking for as far as data with regard to police officers. Um, so those are things that we have to find a way to balance. Um, Brian, how has that informed the efforts you guys are undertaking? We were, obviously it's complicated like everything else because we were looking at a relatively modest data set that we wanted. Um, so obviously not a whole lot of personally identifying information and not a lot of, we didn't really have to worry about complaining witnesses or things like that in a pretrial data set. But looking at it closely, if you really wanted to and you were able to look at a, you know, a spreadsheet or a database with this information in it, you might be able to figure out what case it went to based off things like hearing date and charge and if you had a county identifier. Um, so it give you that someone's charged, which for my clients, that's enough to ruin someone's reputation in, you know, years later, the mere fact that they were charged with a crime. So it's really hard because unless you completely disaggregate it, like Richard was talking about, where it may become much less useful, anything is probably gonna link you back to our, you know, we have a state website that everything in our version of county courts goes into, where everyone can look at anyway that, you know, you may get expunged if you get an expungement later on, but it not certainly not for many years after it happens. So it's how much invasion into someone's reputation later on are we willing to invest to get something that's going to make the system better for everybody. And I know I'm preaching to a big choir here, but I, you know, I don't know where the balance is because if we have no data, things are going to continue to be bad. Um, I think it's the best way to change it. So we have a question from an attendee around the lack of transparency from law enforcement around biometric data in the age of facial recognition, stingrays, et cetera. So in some ways, I, I think what this is also getting at is that you know, data can, there are a lot of different kinds of data um, and there's misconduct data and there's criminal process data and there's just a, a number of different things that folks mean when they talk about data. Um, can you all talk a little bit about how you think about what are the kinds of data that should be made available that should be public beyond sort of the question around individual access and confidentiality? Everything. I mean, if we're going to be transparent, we should be transparent, right? I mean, honestly, I mean, and that's kind of how I'm trying to go about it here that, you know, we have the, if we have it, we should talk about it, put it out there because we don't have anything to hide. I mean, I, I tend to agree for anyone who was here yesterday, there was a great panel on police misconduct, tracking police misconduct, and it was defenders and other organizations keeping track of it themselves in an app that led to a bigger data collection or hopefully will lead to bigger data collection. I think that's similar things like, you know, I learned about the fact that our county was using stingrays and facial recognition from being in an NACDL conference. Not that we knew it, it just happened to be in the materials, which is crazy that I work across the street from police headquarters and I didn't know what they were doing um, because so much of it is kept secret. And you know, our prosecutor's offices have been stuck in the 1800s, a lot of them, dealing with paper, not that we don't deal with terrible case management as well, but that we had a new prosecutor get elected and they took out boxes and boxes of paper because no one had ever typed anything into a computer in 40 years. So how, do, how you deal with all that, you know, how do you get transparency and make it public if you're not collecting it as an issue? And if collection takes money, where does the money come from? Another audience question. Can you talk about your efforts, if applicable, to bring people from the relevant systems on board with these efforts? So Brian, you already mentioned that being one of your challenges, but have you faced a lot of opposition from, for example, departments of corrections, jails, et cetera, and how have you dealt with that? So kind of to the point related to the decentralization of criminal justice data and the multiplicity of state and local agencies that need to be on board for data policy change, um, how have you worked to get those different kinds of state and local actors on board or what have been the opposition that you've heard? In, in Connecticut, um, we had the Cheshire murders um, back in 08 around, and, and that's really what drove the legislation to, to, to have the criminal justice information sharing system to bring all of the data into one under one umbrella. So unfortunately, it took that terrible tragedy to get the legislature to do it, legislature to do it and fund it, um, and it's taking this long to get it up and running, and we are really close to, to, to being there, to, to having it work. Um, and it has, it, it's, it's everything. I mean, it's going to be, you know, it, it's to have the, that data sharing or information from, you know, input from the police to, to the end to probation, parole, to be able to make those decisions that they need to make on people. To Rebecca's point, right, to make sure to see is somebody really um, violent? Are they very, you know, are, are they a risk? And, and, you know, we're looking in Connecticut now to deal with data and figure out a way to 
get rid of you know cash bail and those type of things. So how how can we use those um, assessment tools that Rebecca was talking about in Connecticut? So those are you know we're dealing with it every day. I just want to add in that I think it's really sad in the criminal legal system that it takes some type of big event like murders or the Duke Lacrosse case or Michael Morton or George Floyd or whoever it is to get legislators to actually want to look at the system and figure out what's going wrong to make any change. Um, again, preaching to the squire, but maybe telling legislators, and I'll probably start doing this, that, and we did this with discovery in Virginia, like we don't want to wait for some horrible innocence case to come up or an execution or a murder or whatever it is to try to get this right. Um, to the original question, we had some, it really depends on the agency for us. So our Department of Corrections tracks a bunch of data. Um, you know, it's maybe not the stuff we want and they're not as transparent with it, but they're doing that and making it public. So I think people, organizations like that who are already trying to make those investments and think it's important, it's an easier sell, except when like our state Supreme Court, they collect the data they think they need and they don't wanna change their system ever for any reason. And anything that takes adding an extra field in is treated like it would be redoing the whole system. So I think it's meeting people not only philosophically where they are about data or what they think about the system, but like base level IT systems that we know very little about that people are really committed to and how hard they think it's going to be to change or train people um, when they're complaining about it. And one thing I'd say is, and it's, I mean, it's kind of depressing, but, you know, we just haven't been able to, we, we, our view is if we're going to be working on a law, we're going to have to do enforcement afterwards. And, um, which, you know, makes me feel like we need to do fewer laws so that we can make sure we do really good, um, enforcement. And that goes back to like our first really important data collection bill was supposed to be this great solitary reform measure and it got completely gutted and turned into a data study and everybody was really upset but it was that data that formed the very basis for being able to really argue for meaningful reform afterwards um but even those annual reports that ended up coming out that was showing that they were you know dramatically decreasing solitary which was true they were they went too far and so we ended up doing massive our own massive data study to go and push back on them to get them to and I mean, I could really tell this story about most of the bills that we've passed. And I know not um, all organizations or folks have the uh, resources to do that. So I'm not, you know, I, I understand that. But I really think if there's an, you know, if, if there's a nonprofit that can do an audit, you know, um, every couple years, or if you have a good auditor, which actually Colorado does have a decent auditor, if we can get their attention, um, who can do an audit report, then I think that that's, it's, it's critical. I'm going to be really stupid in this question, but I mean, have you found that people are actually doctoring the data? I mean, I don't know where I'd get the time to be able to kind of finagle, you know what I mean? But, yeah. but has anybody seen that? I can tell you for what we've seen is I, I don't think that I can point to any instance where I believe like that there was somebody behind the scenes saying, I really want to make this data look way better than it is. And I'm going to lie about it. That's not, uh, what we think is going on, including the, we have 300 people in our jail for our 30 person jail. That's not a nefarious, I mean, but it, it, there's an incompetence issue. There's a, do we care? Do we want to do it right? Do we want to take the time to do it right issue? And then I will say with the DOC, the data only was mistaken one direction. So in terms of like, how hard are they looking at their own data when the data serves them, I think is its own question. And I'm actually not talking about the current administration, just to be clear. Um, so uh, do, I don't think there was this nefarious thing, but I also think if the data serves the institution, it is less likely to be looking at it uh, critically. And one of the issues that May Kayla's first question she asked us, I mean, you know, we found the Brian's point, the kind of legacy systems. Well, you know, we really can't add that field to this because it would kind of change the, or the guy that knows how to add that field retired 10 years ago. Realistically, I mean, we've been told that. I mean, it's like, well, so why are we still using that, you know, that operating system or what are we still doing here? Um, so that's an issue that we've had to deal with also in kind of getting everything together. I think, you know, from what we have seen um, in a number of places across the country is both those legacy systems, but I think one of the things that you talked about early on, Richard, which is um, 
you know, that the, the state's attorneys in Connecticut got on board to the data transparency because they saw it as being in their own best interest, that it also supported an investment in a statewide case management system. It supported their ability to be proactive in telling their own story about what happens in prosecution in the state of Connecticut. So I think, you know, really being able to make sure that the variety of entities that own or have to collect the data understand that they can benefit from doing the data collection or doing the data publication um, is, is definitely a, a big thing that we've seen. Although I think then that also sometimes comes into conflict with an attempt to keep costs down because, you know, the newer, fancier systems that are easier for data collection and do more reporting and all of those things are often also more expensive systems. Yes, I have a question for Rebecca kind of on that. So when you were doing the jail work in Colorado, does was that each individual jurisdiction had to report? Was it a statewide system or was it localities that had to invest in that data collection? In the most recent bill that we passed, the way we did it is that the each jurisdiction, it's, a, it's 64 counties, but I think there's fewer than that jails, like 60 jails. Um, each of them need to provide quarterly data to a state um, body. And the state body, it's our Division of Criminal Justice, created a form, and this was in the legislature that, um, that the data was provided in a format that DCJ could use. The DCJ creates a form, and then each jurisdiction has to go online quarterly and fill out that form. And then DCJ posts the data. And of course, the data was demonstrably inaccurate, and there was nobody at DCJ checking it. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in any state, there's rich, rich jurisdictions and poor jurisdictions. And I think that's a it's interesting to think about because, you know, we don't, everyone complains about unfunded mandates to the localities. Um, and how, you know, getting the localities who have the data, because that's where we do criminal legal system work is at the local basis. But then they complain when, you know, the state doesn't pay for it. Um, that is, that is the perpetual refrain we have in every bit of pretrial reform work we do. So like it is the thing that we are dealing with. And that is why we didn't create, we didn't force them to create a computerized data system, which is, you know, we've seen some of these like online real time systems. That's the dream. We would like to have it. But, you know, in these jurisdictions, you know, we were, we just spoke frankly about it. We were like, you have 25 people in your jail. You can have somebody write down the number every single day on a piece of paper. And at the end of the quarter, you can add, you, you know, add up and divide by that number and you have your average daily population. And we really did speak about it that way. And um, by the time we brought this bill, because pretrial reform had been such a subject of conversation, I think it was kind of hard for the sheriff to um, stand against it because, you know, it was, it was upsetting to the legislature that they didn't have the most basic of information about how many people were in their jail. But I just want you to know, in so many other contexts, uh, we have heard that same thing. And I personally do not believe we could have gotten the data collection bill that we got passed on police reform if it weren't this very moment that we're living in. That There's no way, you know, because it's very robust. It's going to take time out of, you know, local law enforcement's time. And so, you know, timing is everything, but we all know that. On that, so just so I understand, are they literally just filling out like a one-page form, for example, with that and sending it in and then someone's putting that up on a website? They, they, it's an, it's an online form. Okay. So they're going in and on, it's an online form and it's supposed to let them know when their data is inaccurate. It's supposed to like blink red if they have more people than if they've listed 300 people and only 30 are in their jail. But there's nobody then going and checking before it was published out. I was surprised because I actually have a lot of respect for our um, state entity that does this and was just surprised about the situation. But hopefully it's going to get corrected. But again, that's only because we're watchdogging. Right. I mean, and that follow-up is so important to, 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 to get a sense of what it's actually, what are we actually reporting out or showing or talking about? Um, you know, I, I found that, you know, it, it really is getting people to kind of come around to it is kind of doing that explanation. Hey, this is going to help you get the resources that you need. So spending a little bit now is going to help you, you know, we're not going to have the issues in the system that we have. We're going to be able to address the racial disparity. We're going to be able to say, hey, you know, you, maybe you do need more prosecutors based on what's coming in. And, and, you know, it allows people to make those arguments with the data. But if you don't have it, you know, you really can't make it. 
And Richard, building on that, you know, you talked a little bit earlier about the raw data and kind of your plans for making the raw data available, but can you talk more about the analyses? Has there been a decision around what are the things that need to be made public based on the data or what are the core questions that, that we're trying to answer with the data that we're asking that prosecutors are now collecting? One of the first things I did when I got appointed chief state attorney is hire a manager of research and planning, so a data person. And, and I've kind of charged him with kind of coming out with data sheets. To, to Brian's point, we have um, a, a statewide agency that's the administrative head, but we have 13 separate judicial districts. Um, and they are all headed by an independent constitutional officer that is appointed by the Criminal Justice Commission. So they are all kind of independent. So, you know, while I'm the administrative head of the agency, I really have no control over what's happening on that independent level. But my plan is to use that data to be able to talk about outliers, to be able to say, hey, you know what, something is different is happening in your jurisdiction than every place else. So, you know, maybe it's a, a crime that you want to handle in your jurisdiction or people are talking about it, but we need to be able to look at it. So one of the first things I've had the data person do is kind of come up with data sheets for each judicial, each judicial district uh, to, to be able to kind of present out there. And now my next ask is to kind of come up with a um, almost a data indicator that I could utilize and send out monthly to um, you know, the legislature, to the governor's office, to anybody that wants to put it on our website to get a sense of the cases that we're handling and how we're handling them. Um, so that's kind of a, my two-step process once we have the ability and I got news actually before we just started that our, we're going to be getting the, the feed from judicial on the pending cases so we could st stand up our, our case management system hopefully in the next couple of months. So that's the plan. Um, and I just want to say, I think what Richard's talking about where you're looking for outliers is such an important use of the data, especially going back to like Brian was, suggest was saying, and we've heard this too about um, some bias data that we want collected, that... Uh, that there's a concern that, oh, well, this is just going to show bias. And because it's already going to show what we already know, it's just going to create more fodder for calling criminal legal system actors, you know, racist. And um, putting aside whether that's a good idea or bad idea, because I, we might have some disagreements about, about that, um, it, it mo I think in a lot of ways, more importantly than just confirming what we know, it allows us to find pat problematic patterns. And one of the places this came up, and maybe this is sort of like a problem, a data collection problem, is we have been pushing for a bias study regarding the CPAT, that risk assessment tool, for quite a while. And in the last legislation, which everything died because of COVID, um, there was a, a big pretrial bill that included this bias study. And one of the things in this group that was working on the bill, you know, like a big working group, we wanted granular level data so that you could, you could really compare county to county to county. And that was a huge sticking point, and we lost on it. And they were going to go judicial district level data, which is many counts. And um, that is because individual, and they, I mean, they actually said this during the working group, like individual judges, they didn't want to be identified. And in some counties, you know, there's really only one or two uh, county judges, so you really know who that data is about. And um, I just found that shocking that, I mean, I shouldn't, I, that, that makes me seem naive, but I, I found it shocking that that was being said openly and we actually compromised on it, which um, the bill didn't pass and I'm not sure we'd make that compromise again, but people don't want to be called out for doing exactly the thing you're talking about doing, Richard, which is, I mean, in an ideal world, you're identifying and fixing, right? Um, but Right. Right. I mean, and it's so huge because, I mean, even the prosecutor collection in Connecticut, I mean, you know, our judges, they, they're appointed similar to the, the state attorneys and they have a term of office so they don't have to run for election. Uh, but yeah, you're going to find because right, you're in the system, you understand that, you know, this judge does this one thing. And when they move around year to year, you can kind of see where that one thing is happening. So, um, you know, it, it is a concern. Um, I, I think that some people are going to end up hating what we do with our data, but um, I think it's important. I mean, look, we don't have anything to hide. We should be, we should be talking about it. We should be looking at it and utilizing it and, you know, to make the system better for everybody. I mean, we just have to. Just to chime in, our sentencing commission, that was exactly the conversation they had when they were talking about collecting race for our sentencing guidelines data, um, that individual judges didn't want it to come back to them. And in the minutes of the sentencing commission, the judges specifically killed that collection piece because they didn't want that. I mean, how do we combat that? Because I, 
that I don't understand why they would have the deciding vote. And it really does seem like sort of the area we should collectively win that as public servants that we should like, un we should understand the data behind our actions. Um, I, and I mean, still right now looking back and saying, why did, why did we compromise on that? Why did we feel so pressured to do so? Because I feel like we could stand up to the legislature and say, of course you want to know what each individual judge, judge is doing. How well, but Rebecca, I mean, if you compromise on it and you get the initial data, then you, once you get it and you, you get your foot in the door, then you could expand to get the rest. I mean, and, and really that's where you have to look at it is, you know what, you know, if we take it this stuff in baby steps then we're going to be able to get to everything that we need. I mean, that's why I looked at the, the, the Connecticut bill is you kind of the floor of what we should capture as prosecutors. We're capturing a lot more. Um, but, you know, what's in the legislation is only the floor. Also, with the judge's point as well, and this applies to prosecutors, public defenders, defense attorneys, everybody, like the judges, same groups of judges who are stopping the collection of this data will come back and tell me all about the implicit bias training that they got at their conference. It's like, well, if someone could tell you whether you may have an implicit bias, like we could look at it and show you. Someone showed me like, hey, you go to trial more often for white people than Hispanic people, or you take better plea deals for black people than Native American people. I would wanna know that, right? And I don't have that type of data collection for me, but people, like we have that data for judges. Do you depart from the guidelines? Do you do that? And it, it would really go a long way for implicit bias if they actually, you know, could sh I could say you have implicit bias which is what they don't want, but it could lead to a conversation. Um, so very quickly, there are two questions that I'd like to get to before um, our time is up in five minutes. So first is about data collection related to trans people. And if anybody either collects data on gender identity as it relates to biological sex, and if so, what analyses exist on um, how trans people are treated in jails and other correctional settings. And then the second question, I'll put them both out here because we don't have a lot of time, is whether indigent defense funding has been affected by data. And I think the question in particular is, has, how, do you know of any examples in which data has been used successfully to justify increasing resources for indig indigent defense? Well, let me just speak to the trans piece for a moment. I mean, we have decent data from our DOC on um, trans folks and are able to get that through rec open records, not with uh, personally identifying information, obviously. Um, so, but, I mean, but will we have use of force related to trans folks? Can we get that through the DOC? No, you know, they're not gonna, they're, but um, in terms of like where people are housed and living, living conditions, how many are there, like we can get some, some decent data. But I have to tell you, we faced a real problem with this in um, the police accountability bill we just passed, which has data collection related to stops and use of force, um, dynamic entries. And uh, that, it, it initially included a really wide set of demographic data that we wanted from folks, which included gender identity. And we just got enormous um, pushback from all sides. And I mean, people had very widely divergent views on it. And one of the big issues is, how are cops supposed to collect this data, right? Like in a stop. Uh, and right now the standard practice I've learned is it's basically be, ob everything's observation based, right? Um, and so asking police officers to make observations, and we even had um, sexual preference was even in there, and to make observations in these short periods that are asking them to make these judgments about people and to draw attention to it, um, we had just, we didn't keep it in. And um, there were really strong feelings about it and including about not having it in there. So we just have the basic demographic pieces, the race and ethnicity and age. Um, so I just wanted to share that. And I'm not one sure what to issues, do about it. Yeah, I mean, one of the issues we have is, is even the, the race is kind of subjective to the officer filling that out when they, when they, they make the stop or they fill out the paperwork. So, um, you know, what do you do for a multiracial person? Which, which way are they going to lean? Um, so it, it, it's, you know, we're looking at the data kind of with that, that caveat. So I know that we're not capturing it yet, but I know that it is, I mean, Connecticut, we are able to, people are able to identify male, female, or gender X now in Connecticut. Um, and there was a big wrench that, that threw a big wrench into the, the collection of data, the CGIS, because they didn't know how to categorize that. 
and it was a big change to the system, but they got it done. They figured it out. Really briefly on the indigent defense question, there's definitely been a lot of studies nationwide about indigent defense funding and there you get into big questions like workload and caseload. What does the number of cases show you? Something, but how long those cases take or how long someone spends on it. Um, Body-worn cameras, things like that are gonna take a lot more time. So I think it's, things have been done. We need to do more and we need to be specific and intentional about what data we collect to see injury defense funding levels to make sure we're accurately co collecting it much and same for prosecutors as well. And quickly, I'll just say that I have, you know, I, I know that um, our Office of the State Public Defender in Colorado has utilized substantially utilized data to argue for increased number of lawyers or resources, and in some cases successfully so. I mean, as you know, they're always under-resourced, but um, data has been essential. I've read their reports, so. And to that, in, the, in Connecticut, I mean, um, there was a, a lawsuit filed that there was, uh, for the public defenders of Connecticut, to have a, a certain caseload that they have to look at, so that helps them with staffing. Um, I don't know how much it helps them, but I mean, I, I know that's something that's, if you want to look at kind of another avenue to go or look at, it's, you know, a study was done in Connecticut that, hey, you can only handle a number of cases, so something to think about. Great. So we are just about at time. So I just want to thank uh, the panelists as well as the attendees for all of your contributions and your great questions. I do want to note that there were a number of comments on the side asking for materials, reports, links to bills or, you know, potential bills, things like that. Um, so Monica, maybe you can give a little heads up on where folks find the materials that have been already put together. And then finally, my understanding is that everyone, uh, myself and the panelists information is available. So you guys can also reach out separately directly to us. Yes, Michaela, that is correct. So we did share the panelists contact information in the chat. Um, so feel free to reach out to them directly if you have any follow up questions. Um, the conference materials page is available on our, web, our website. Um, so if you want to visit NACL.org and search the State Criminal Justice Network, you will find a link to all of the materials um, for the conference. Um, if there's anything missing, we are constantly updating the page, so I'm sure it will probably be there tomorrow. <laughs> so check back um, for any materials or any updates on bills and reports that were referenced throughout this um, presentation. Um, I just want to thank our, our panelists, our moderator, for this great discussion on exploring data and criminal justice reform. So thank you so much for um, sharing your time and sharing your expertise and just sharing your experience with getting this, um, these type of legislation passed in your states and what advocates can expect when trying to pursue um, similar legislation in their states.